Hello everyone, my name is Christos Tavridis and I'm currently a technical artist at SideFX in the Labs team. In this video I'm going to break down a part of Hexagona, my beloved personal project. Hexagona is a procedurally generated hexagon tile board inspired by board games. The asset can be used inside Houdini or a game engine to set up different maps, levels or boards. There are parameters that let you tweak the landscape and sea level, color the tiles, scatter foliage, rocks or custom meshes. You can download the latest version from GitHub. You will also find the light version of the project that only contains the core functionalities. This stripped down version might be easier to deconstruct and see how it was built. For this breakdown, we're going to be focusing on the grid generation. More specifically, the first two nodes of the network. First is for the generation of points, and second for the different calculations like the position of the points. Let's start with a small analysis. This is the shape that we want to generate. We want to use the power of Houdini, which is points and attributes, and the first step would be to generate the points. One way to generate the points is by running a detailed wrangle once with the add function. Another way is to first generate all the points needed and then move them into position by using a point wrangle. I found the second way to be more performant and this is what we're going to be using for the grid generation. We then generate different attributes like color, height position, coordinates, orient and groups. And finally instantiate the hexagon shapes to the points. When it comes to generating the grid, I found there is a very popular way of doing it. That is by first generating a base rectangular grid layout where all the points have an equal x and z distance. You can easily do this inside of Houdini without vex by using the grid node. For visualization reasons and to get a better understanding of the distances, I've also added hexagons to the points. In this way, we see that we need to reposition some of the points to better fit the hexagons. We need to create a group for every second line of points and offset them in the X position. Then we need to readjust the scale of the Z position of all the points. We have our grid, but now in order for the overall shape to be a hexagon, we need to make a selection of points that are outside the hexagon shape and delete them. Finally, we need to move the grid to the world center in order to utilize some radial properties. The grid is ready. Now we just need to instantiate the hexagon mesh to the points. Although this is the most popular way of generating a hexagon grid, it didn't fit my needs and it wasn't so performant. The performance gets heavier when using nodes like Transform, Match Size or Blast instead of Vex. Besides the performance, by generating points in this way, we don't get to have circular symmetry when generating the points and the attributes that come out of it. That's when I thought that there should be a more sophisticated way of generating a hexagonal grid without having to create unwanted points to delete. Having the circular symmetry in mind, I tried to find a way to generate the points in concentric rings expanding from an origin. In this way, I could get some properties that I could use to drive different attributes. Considering that I only had the point attribute as my main input variable to use for the calculations, I needed to find different formulas or patterns to generate the grid in this way. I also found this to be the most challenging and also fun part of the project. I love a good challenge, so I got very stubborn trying to solve it. I had a lot of help from my colleagues Danica Oglesby and Mai Yao, who also love puzzles. Before moving further, we should look at some properties that we're going to be using. From the radius of the hexagon, we can get its height and width. Both the width and height of the hexagon are needed to calculate the distances between the points in the grid. A big shout out to Amit Patel and RedBlobGames.com. His website is my bible when it comes to hexagons, grids, game dev and math. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted the points to generate in rings from an origin. More accurately, they're going to generate in a spiral. So for every ring, we start at x equals 0 and iterate counterclockwise. This is also the formula for the points generation based on the grid size, which essentially is the number of rings. For our calculations and functions, we will be needing some integer variables. Those variables will act as multipliers or iterators in the same way you use them in for loops. These are going to be properties of the ring and they derive from the PT num, which is our main iterator. While developing the generator, I found it extremely helpful to expose the ring variables as attributes for debugging in the spreadsheet. For this breakdown, I'm going to be using a hexagon with three rings as an example, which I color coded to be more visually distinct. Let's see the ring variables that we will be using. The ring index is pretty straightforward and it's the index of each ring. The ring count is a counter similar to the PT num, but starts from zero in each ring. The ring half count is the same as the ring count, but divides each ring in two, so we get a counter that repeats twice. The ring edge is also a counter that we get when we divide each ring in six equal parts, in the same sense that we have the six edges of the hexagon. 
We will also need some functions that return values we will be using as multipliers or iterators. The reason for these functions is that we need different oscillating values similar to the ones we get from waveform functions. The triangle function is going to return values that oscillate between plus 1 and minus 1. We also need to have more step repetitions of the same value and we get that with a multiplier. So this is what we get with a multiplier of 2 and a multiplier of 3. The waveform function is more specific to the rings in idiosyncrasy and returns values in a similar manner to a sine wave but without the zeros. This function returns values that oscillate between plus 1 and minus 1, with plus 0.5 and minus 0.5 added as well. This function is also ring dependent and correlates with the ring edges, so we get different step repetitions for the same oscillating values. For the first ring we get one repetition, for the second we get two, and for the third ring we get three step repetitions. Now that we have our variables, let's see how we can use them and how they are a part of different patterns that are found in the grid. After we generate the points, we need to move them into position. Let's start with the Z position. When we lay out the grid, these are the Z position values that we get. H stands for the hexagon height as we saw earlier in the hexagon properties. To make things more clear, we're going to divide with the hexagon height times 0.75. This is the result we are left off with. We need to remember that the points are going to generate in a spiral, so to help ourselves we will color the rings. Now it's easier for us to look for patterns. The first sequence that emerges from this colored layout is related to the ring half count that we saw earlier. What we see here is an integer counter that starts from zero, goes all the way up to the value of the ring index it belongs to, then this value repeats for ring index minus one times and then decreases until it reaches 1. This pattern starts with values that have a positive sign and then change to a negative sign. To start with, we will use an if statement and use the ring half count as the iterator. When the iterator reaches the value of the ring index, we want to multiply the ring index value with 3 and then for each step decrease it by 1. This way it's going to end at the value of 1. We see that we're very close to the sequence with the exception of those dotted line circles that need to have the value of the ring index. We will then use another if statement to replace the values that are bigger from the ring index with the ring index value itself. Almost there. Now we need to take care of the sign, and for that we will use the triangle function with a multiplier equal to the ring index times 3. We need to multiply those values with the ones from before, and we got our sequence. We just need to multiply again with hexagon height times 0.75, and we get our z position values for all the points. Let's move to the X position. I saved this for last as it's a more complex process. By laying down the points we get those values for the X position. We will divide those values with the hexagon width to get something cleaner to work with. Let's also change the colors layout to help recognize some patterns. I'm going to break down this sequence into two parts for clarity. First of all, we see that the repeating patterns relate to the ring edge. Second, if we see the first value of each ring edge group, indicated by the dotted line circle, we see that it has the same value as the ring index, then half the ring index, and once more half the ring index. And then this part repeats itself. This sequence of numbers is the first of two parts, and we should work with that for now before moving further. In order to achieve this sequence, we're going to use the ring index and multiply it with a waveform function. We will need to offset the waveform function because instead of starting with plus 0.5, we need to start with plus 1. This is what we get by multiplying them. Let's start working on the second part. If we place the final result and the first part that we just created side by side, we might understand better what we're missing. What we already have are the starting values and the positive and negative signs. Now for the tricky part. For each ring edge group, we see that there are subtractions being made in iterations. For example, here in the first ring edge group, we start by subtracting 0 from part A, then 0.5 and then 1. For the second group, we start by subtracting 0, then 1 and then 2, which is the same pattern as for the first group but multiplied with 2. We can see this pattern of subtracting for the rest of the ring edges. Let's consider the sequence of 0, 1, 2 for now. That's easy to get by taking the division remainder of the ring count to ring index. For the parts of the sequence that we have half values, we will need to use the waveform function as a multiplier. If we apply the waveform function, we see that we take values of 0.5 and 1, which is exactly what we want. 
After we multiply those together, we get part B as a result. Then we need to subtract part B from part A. We multiply those values with a hexagon width and we get the X position for the points. And that was a brief breakdown of the math and patterns that I used to generate the hexagonal grid for this project. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this breakdown informative. Please make sure to also check the HDA and reach out to me if you have any questions or just want to say hi.